Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Astronaut John Harrington is here, and there are so many different facets to his life to go through. It's going to be really, really amazing. Now, before we get started with our program, as always, I'd like to talk to you about a few different things going on, and I am going to share my screen here. Let's uh, open up one thing, because tonight is basically prize night in terms of uh, some things we wanted to share. We have, we've had a, a bunch of giveaways within Social Flight, and uh, let me share the first one that we have here. Um, uh, so with this, I'd like to share that um, uh, Kevin Braun, and that is the uh, picture that you have here, has uh, won our latest Fly to Win Challenge. That's where you take the Social Flight mobile app. You just uh, search on Apple or Android devices for Social Flight. And uh, you get the app, you get points automatically for anywhere that you fly to as part of Fly to Win. And we are constantly giving away prizes. It puts a big smile on my face to do this because it supports everyone in general aviation. And so uh, Lyle uh, is uh, from uh, Sterling, Nebraska. He has uh, been uh, uh, using Social Flight and playing a Fly to Win Challenge and flying everywhere in his Cessna 150 since 2017. And uh, he won a complete prize pack of, uh, of things from Tempest. Tempest, I'll tell you, I've been in, uh, uh, in the uh, maintenance field for a long time. And I've been uh, using Tempest products for as long as I can remember. They're just fantastic. I love, I just changed out their spark plugs, oil filters, all this stuff. And Lyle's getting a complete set of that. We have more prizes going on, so be sure to check that out. We're giving away a headset right now, which is going to be a, which is a Zulu 3 from Lightspeed. So again, be sure to check that out. The next thing that I wanted to talk about also is we had our prize for flying eyes, giving away a pair of flying eyes, custom sunglasses to be chosen. That has been uh, one, as you can see here, by uh, Kevin Braun from Southern Saskatchewan, Canada. He flies a 2003 Cirrus SR20, flies regularly throughout the uh, crisis uh, that's been going on to support his local FBO and everyone else in the industry. During this time, he got night rated. He's uh, working on his IFR training. And um, just a big congratulations to Kevin as well so that uh, we can uh, do that. And then lastly, just to let you know, of course, there's more stuff coming out on our Mustang build project, which is right behind me, and uh, a brand new video here uh, where the boys have been working on the bottom of the tail, finishing out that. Uh, we've got that coming out. We've got uh, uh, tailwheel doors going on. There's a ton going on on this project, and we are just way behind in getting videos out to you, but there's really uh, a lot to show. So with that, um, I would just like to let you all know, of course, that the tonight's broadcast will be recorded and available on YouTube. Just search for Social Flight, one word, Social Flight, on YouTube. You can also uh, see our recorded broadcast at socialflight.com and in the Social Flight mobile apps. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our featured guest of the evening. John Harrington is a retired United States Naval aviator, a pilot, an engineer, and a former NASA astronaut. With the launch of the Space Shuttle Endeavor in 2002, he became the first enrolled member of a Native American tribe to fly into space. He also served as the commander of the NEMO-6 mission aboard the Aquarius Underwater Laboratory, living and working underwater for 10 days. John also stars in the IMAX film Into America's Wild, alongside another one of our guests here on Social Flight Live, Ariel Tweedo. And Into America's Wild is an unforgettable cross-country adventure into the hidden wonders of the natural world here in the United States. And with the reopening of theaters across the country, it should be coming to a theater near you soon. So um, I encourage you to go and uh, get that. And with that, I would like to please welcome John Harrington to the broadcast. How are you doing, John? Hey, Jeff, doing great, man. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us this evening. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you up before beforehand, so looking forward to it. Now, your, your story covers so many things. I don't even know how we're going to narrow this down into one evening broadcast. But tell, tell me how it starts. Tell me um, where you grew up, how you got connected to uh, aviation, and then found your way through uh, the, the Navy. 
Well, I started off, I'm from Oklahoma originally. I'm a, a native of Oklahoma. My mom's side of the family is Chickasaw. I'm a member of the Chickasaw Nation, citizen of the Chickasaw Nation through my mom's side. Uh, my dad's side of the family came in on a wagon uh, during the uh, land rush days in uh, Oklahoma. So I got both, both sides of my family, but I didn't grow up in Oklahoma. We moved away very early. We ended up in Colorado, lived in Wyoming for a bit, uh, moved to Texas for a bit. And once I graduated from high school in Plano, Texas, I came back to Colorado, University of Colorado to go to, uh, to, go to school there. But my dad uh, has always been in aviation. He was an instructor pilot. You know, growing up when I was little, we had an Aeronica Champ. We had a little Cessna 150. There I think I have go. a picture of that. I'm going to interrupt you just because I think we have a picture of exactly what you're just saying. Yeah, yeah little kids, me, it's my dad. I love his aviator glasses. That was a 150, I think, out at, um, at uh, Peterson Air Force Base. Uh, Miller Wolf Arrow, I think, is where that, that photo was taken in Colorado Springs. My dad uh, earned his um, CFI there, and then he bought an Aeronica Champ. Uh, little Veronica that uh, we took up to Wyoming. We lived in Riverton, Wyoming for a bit. And my dad instructed in that. So that is in the, you know, that's up on the plateau above Riverton. And this airplane, this beautiful airplane, my dad sold it and, and bought another 150 and then instructed in that until I was about 15. So I'd fly, I'd be on the right seat and my dad would say, your airplane. And he'd lean over me and open the window and take pictures. So I was comfortable in airplane from, from early on. Then my dad actually went to be a crop duster. He learned to fly uh, from Jimmy Dore's flying service in Marigold, Mississippi, and he flew Stearman's um, as a crop duster. So uh, that was always funny. I guess one of his uh, instructors was a Luftwaffe pilot. And my dad said, you try and get a picture of the guy and he always turned his back on him, so. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Imagine that. Guys, yeah, a lot of guys from Vietnam my dad flew with. So they flew Stearman's and, and uh, for, our, for my dad's birthday just a few years ago, I got him a ride in a Stearman out at uh, El Reno, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, so I've been involved in aviation ever since. And that Aeronica, little story there, I think we talked about, I was driving through Montana last year. My dad says, hey, there's a, the Aeronica's in Big Timber, Montana. You need to go find it. And so I drove up to Big Timber, Montana, and I found the airport manager. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, that airplane's like two hangers over. So he called the owner and the owner came up, opened the hangar and let me take my picture next to uh, the remodeled uh, Aronica that my dad had as a kid. So when I was oh a kid. Oh my God, that is so, so cool. Is that the one that was like, wait, hold on. Let me see if that's this, uh, the one that we were just talking here. So, so this is that? That same airplane. I'm a little oh bit my bigger. God, the same, that's the same one that, as, as you were in when we went back to, to uh, this one right here? Same end number. Uh, the guy did a beautiful job restoring it. I apologize. Don't, don't remember his name, but uh, very, very gracious. And he took my photo with my dad's plane and my dad was thrilled. So we, we wow. follow our airplanes. You know, airplanes are like family, right? We follow yeah. them through their existence. My dad will always search up, where's this Cherokee? You know, where's, where's Ironica? So yeah, pretty neat. Anyway, that's my aviation background was really through my dad. And, and, uh, but I used to sit in a cardboard box when I was little. We lived in Black Forest, Colorado back in the height of the Apollo program. And I wanted, yeah, I dreamed about being an astronaut. Myself, my brother, and a guy named Lynn Miller was sitting in a cardboard box, lay on our back and pretend we're Apollo astronauts. And, uh, wow. you know, but you never, you dream about it, but that's not something I ever thought I could accomplish, you know, and, and but you know, little things happen in your life. And I met the right people and, and uh, met a guy when I was a senior in college. Well, I got kicked out of college first. I don't know if I told you that. I got kicked out of college. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, when I moved to Colorado, I started working in a restaurant, and I, I loved the outdoors. I wanted to be a forest ranger. I wanted to work outside, and, and um, I was out in the Garden of Gods one day, and these two guys were climbing, and they looked down, and they said, you want to climb? And I went, love to. Well, I spent most of my time climbing and not much time studying. I had a, a whopping 1.72 grade point by the end of the semester and uh, got kicked out of school as a freshman. Went to work in the mountains as a surveyor, as a rock climber on a Interstate 70 in Glenwood Canyon. And the guy I worked for convinced me if I want to make something myself, I better get my butt back in school and, uh, and become an engineer, be the one responsible for, for everything, not just the, you know, the lowest sky on the rung of the ladder. So went back mm -hmm. to school, the motivation to study now, met some neat people. I had a tutor. I was a tutor to a gentleman who was a retired Navy captain who flew dauntless dive bombers in World War II, Do uh, Captain Richard Knockle. And I was his calculus tutor, and he was my Navy tutor, and he convinced me to join the Navy in 1983, and I did. 22-year career, best decision ever made. Oh, my God, so. that is 
Awesome. Is this uh, this one? Because I've got one of you in a uh, in a Texan here. Yeah, that was. Uh, I joined the Navy in '83. Got my wings in '85. Officer candidate school. Uh, by the time my first tour, I flew P3 Orions. I was uh, I hunted subs for about four years in the Western Pacific, uh, Adak, Alaska. I was in the Philippines. I learned how to fly in really bad weather. You know, I learned how to fly in nasty weather and uh, and, and flying with a group of people. I mean, I was a, you were you, your leadership skills had to come out at an early age, which I you know I really appreciate that. Uh, most of my friends went to work for the airlines. I have friends that fly for Delta, friends that fly for United, and and uh, you know I just had that that. The inkling, if I really want to be an astronaut, the, I'd have to, I, I can't go to the airlines, you know, let's see if I can go to test pilot school. So I applied to the Navy test pilot school twice, uh, wasn't selected the first time, really fortunate second time around, um, I was selected and went to Patuxent River, Maryland, where I got to fly oh, 25 different airplanes, so the T-6 Texan that you, you pulled up there, I had a chance to fly that. Uh, flew F-18, we, uh, T-38, A-4, T-A-4, J, T-2. Uh, Calspan has a, a variable stability Learjet that you could fly like an F-16. You could fly it like a DC-3. Wow. Uh, just, uh, you, you really learn how to apply the mathematics background you have, the technical background you have to evaluating airplanes and being able to say what's wrong with the airplane. You know, because you're, you're a good aviator. You know how to fly. If there's something that's objectionable about the plane, then you're able to communicate that back to the engineer. So you're that bridge between the the, the operational community and the uh, engineering community. And you can speak both languages. And so uh, it was a fabulous experience. I went to France and flew an Alpha Jet for my final project. Wow. Had two weeks, had two weeks to write a report about Yay Big, and uh, <laughs> and all all flying qualities and performance of a jet I'd never flown before. So uh, one of the hardest years of my life, but I I loved it. It was hard, you know, at frustrating times. And and then uh, I knew if I'd be an astronaut, I needed a master's degree. So I applied in the Navy to get a master's degree. Uh, went to postgraduate school. Uh, earned a master's in uh, aeronautical engineering, avionics, my, back, my background, GPS, INS integration. Oh, wow. Applied a couple times to NASA. First time I applied as a pilot. And since I didn't have a thousand hours of tactical jet time, which was a requirement for pilot, I applied next time as a mission specialist. And boy, when you get the phone call to be interviewed, you're like, oh, you know, that, that's a remarkable phone call. And I said, if, if that's the only thing I do in my life is get called down to, to interview to be an astronaut, I'm, I, that's great. And then I got selected. That's an even better phone call. <laughs> I got selected oh my God. Six, uh, to the 16th group of astronauts. We're called the Sardines, uh, largest group ever selected, uh, 44 people, 35 U.S., nine internationals, nine women. Uh, great group of folks. I mean, just uh, incredibly talented from a broad, broad range of backgrounds. All technical, though. All, everybody had a technical background. Yeah, mm. uh, they, they that's oh. fascinating. Now, uh, quickly back to your training. The, the, the T6, that was in, in when you were in the uh, test pilot school? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what did you learn in to get to the Orion? Oh, wow. Um, well, when I, to fly the P3 Orion, I went through primary and uh, intermediate in Pensacola, Florida. Went down to Corpus Christi, Texas, flew the T44 King Air, essentially. I uh, got my, you know, my multi-engine. I got my, you know, you can go with the FAA and take the military equivalency test. And I got my instrument rating, my multi-engine, my single engine. I got all my got the ratings. And then I went to the RAG, the replacement air group in Moffett Field, California, and started flying the P3. So uh, BP40, BP31 at Moffett Field, you know, the big, huge, you know, big, right. huge uh, the blimp hangar there at Moffett. And I was there and we deployed, um, I was in BP48. We deployed to uh, Adak, Alaska twice in the winter, once to the Philippines, uh, Subic, um, QB Point in the Philippines in the, in the monsoons. And... Uh, <laughs> And chase Russian subs and and Thai pirates and uh, did some really neat stuff. I've got some pretty remarkable stories, search and rescue stuff off the Commodoreskis and and the Curl Islands and you know and hurricane force winds, bad weather and yeah. It's, uh, do you do you find that that the experience that you had? You mentioned that you obviously in the Orion just got big, big time experience in, in bad weather flying and having to fly in all types of conditions. How does that factor into the flying that you do just as a, as a pilot in general, the, the lessons you learned from intentionally penetrating rough weather? Well, you know, it's back then you try, you, you have a mission you have to accomplish and that mission drives what decisions you make. And you know, certainly in wartime, it's even, even that, that you, you change your, your thought process and, and something like that. You know, for me, I was, you know, I was in test pilot school during the first Gulf War. I was in NASA in the second one. Uh, so I've never, I've never flown in combat or anything. 
but flying the P3, we were doing exactly what we do in wartime, except dropping torpedoes. So hmm. we would we we would uh, go out and search, localize, and track uh, Soviet submarines out in the Pacific. You know, we had ballistic missile submarines off the coast of California, you know, for a long time. And our job was to find them and keep an eye on them. And if the bubble went up, then our job was to, uh, you know, was to attack them. And uh, fast forward, you know, 13 years, I'm in, I'm in mother Russia, flying from the Black Sea back to Moscow in the belly of a Russian Tupolev 727 ski. The guy next to me is a Russian Air Force major, a cosmonaut, and we're looking out a window. The the um, the payload, the payload bay, the luggage compartment was converted into an observation post, and it had all these big cushions in it and a big window. And I'm laying next to this Russian cosmonaut, pointing out where he was born and where he was married. We're flying over the town, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I never would have imagined having done that, you know, that you know many years ago. But here I was in a whole different environment, working with people that I had once been trained to uh, as an adversary. And, and I think it was a whole different way of thinking. I, I loved it. Absolutely. I, I loved working in Russia and, and the cosmonauts and people I met. And it was a far cry from, you know, hunting Russian subs in the Pacific. <laughs> wow. So how did, how did, how did your, that was your NASA work that took you into Russia? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. I didn't realize that there there was. Uh, I knew that uh, that there was work, to, you know, together to some degree, but I didn't know it was as as kind of intimate as you're describing it. Oh, it is. Uh, well, I was uh, assigned as a commander to uh, one of the expeditions. I was going to be a commander to two Russians. Um, I was a backup to a guy named Pavel Vinogradov and uh, my two cosmonaut crewmates, uh, Fyodor Yurchikin and Oleg Kotev. Those were we were a crew. And so I got assigned and I went over to Russia off and on uh, learning, you know, learning Russian in, in the morning, uh, learning the service module. I was learning the systems and everything like that. Uh, lived in cottages at Star City, which is Zvezny Gorodok is the you know, Star City. I learned a little bit of Russian, you know, and, uh, and I, uh, you know, I was by myself. It was a, it was a challenging time um, for me personally. I, just had, I was getting divorced and, and I was traveling back and forth and everything. And, and, uh, and I got a call from a, a flight doc that said I had osteoporosis and uh, I was disqualified from flying on the on the Soyuz. They said I had a high risk of fracturing my back coming back on the Soyuz when it lands. It lands in Kazakhstan on the in the desert and it can come down pretty hard if there's a you know of some failure failure modes and and uh, flying in space is a fabulous thing, but I walk more than I would fly in space and I I certainly didn't want to you know, get injured and so I had the opportunity. Uh, to fly in the shuttle again, but we weren't flying the shuttle because Columbia was a missionary after mine. I lost seven friends on Columbia, you know, three of my classmates, and um, and I didn't know if I'd ever fly again. And I got offered a commercial, a job as a commercial test pilot for a commercial space company. Wow. So, so your work w with the the uh, um, with the the Russian program was after your uh, your NASA flight. Well, after I after I flew my shuttle flight, yeah, it was about 2003, 2004, um, and then. Um, we flew again in 2005, I think, STS-114. So mm -hmm. we went over, we trained. We, in 1999, I think, went over to Russia with a couple of folks, uh, a couple of my classmates, and trained in the Soyuz. We did survival training. We, we, we were getting the Soyuz on the back of a Russian trawler outside of Sochi uh, on the Black Sea. And we had to change out of our Sokol, the Russian uh, launch and entry suit, and put on a feral suit. Feral means trout. And it's a survival suit. It's an exposure suit. And you imagine doing it with two of your friends in the front of a Volkswagen. Essentially, it's the room you have. <laughs> oh, my and you got to get one. And, oh, by the way, it's you have a little teeny hose that's blowing tepid air on you to keep you cool. I had 104 temperature coming out of that capsule and that day. It was pretty, I was pretty messed up. Oh, my God. So, yeah, it was pretty hot. They put a thermometer ear, and, and I, ended up, I ended up falling into an ice bath. <laughs> so, wow. Challenging. It's, it, the stuff that a lot of folks don't know about that we do is, is astronauts train with cosmonauts and they come over and they train with us too. So it was a real neat mixture of, of aviation, aerospace, and it's not politics. It wasn't the politics. It was that you had people that had a common interest and a common goal, the same type of uh, you know, dreams and aspirations that we all have. It's just a different political system. Mm. And that wasn't our issue. We, that's not our pay grade. Our pay grade is to be operators. Our pay grade is to be able to fly and, and do what we're trained to do. I loved it. I wish I could. So take take me back to the, your your beginning with NASA and and what's the process 
after you kind of get uh, you you get that interview, you get the select selection, but how does it actually progress to the point that you know you're you're going to get uh, you're going to be on one of the missions? Well, you don't. That that's the challenge is you don't know. You don't know when that's going to happen, and when it happens, it's a complete surprise sometimes. Um, you, you get selected, and I remember one of our classes we're sitting down, and John Young, you know, Apollo 16 commander, flown twice in every vehicle except Mercury. Stands in front of us and goes, well, you know, you came here to make a lot of money. You came to the wrong place. You know, he said, <laughs> we're here to do a mission. That's exactly how he talked. He was a wonderful guy. And uh, he said, but, um, you know, this is, you know, you always got to take care of yourself. You got to watch people are trying to kill you. Very, very safety conscious guy. He was always about what, what can we do to protect the crew? And uh, you sit in class for about a year and a half. You take classes. You're in the simulator. You learn to fly. I learned to fly the T-38. Um, I'd flown it at test pilot school, but now I was training with guys that, um, you know, the head of the aircraft operations was Captain Bob Naughton. He was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He was in Hanoi Hilton. He was a, he was the head of operations. I got to fly with Bob a few times. He passed away just very recently and absolutely the most wonderful gentleman you could ever meet. I flew with some really, really neat people uh, as instructors. Um, for about a year and a half, you, you also start working for the office. You, my job was to be the integration between the operational guys and GPS, the engineers, and we're putting it on the shuttle, and we're putting it on the space station. And that was John Young's thing. Captain Young wanted that, he wanted GPS to replace the TAC ants. And mm. so that was my job, was to work with the engineers and, and be that conduit between the engineering community and the operational community. And that's what I was trained to do as a test pilot. So I, I, was, I was doing exactly what I was trained to do as a military aviator and test pilot at NASA. I loved it. That's fascinating. So. You know, I think a lot of people don't really realize we, God, we take G GPS for granted, but, but it only arrived in the 1990s and the rest of our, you know, in, in, you know, for at least for those of us that aren't in the military and, and it was all uh, INS, inertial navigation systems before that. And, and even yeah. God, I mean, a lot of the airliners only got GPS fairly recently. And so sure, that was your, that was really your specialty. Yeah, the idea is how do you take GPS and INS? You know, INS, you know, you're going to yank and bank and depends on what you're doing with the plane. And the INS is really good at keeping up with those accelerations and the change in velocities, and, you know, um, but the GPS doesn't update that quickly. So if you're going to put these two together, you know, at what point in time do you take the GPS and you filter out the information coming from the GPS as you yank and bank and yada, yada, yada. And then when you're now steady state, then you update that state vector with this GPS information. So it's a really tightly coupled, hmm. uh, so fil it's a filter, it's a common filter is what it is, multiple input, multiple output. Uh, and you learn how to, the math behind it and the matrix algebra and all that fun stuff. Um, you know, that's what I, that's what I did in my, my undergraduate was, was a mathematic. Wow. So that was pretty cool. That is so, so cool. I love that. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about how you get in. Then I want to go through some of these pictures. Sure. Um, but but so so you were working, of course, as you mentioned, for a year and a half, uh, uh, kind of in in the office side of it and the technical side of it. When did it start to to when did it change to being mission focused for you? Well, I went from that job to being what's called a Cape Crusader, and I got to tell you, this is the best job in the this is the best job on the face of the earth is being the guy, a part of the team that goes down and supports all launches and landings. So I would hop in a T-38 and I would fly. We, we, we crusade to the Cape. That was our mm -hmm. thing. Sleep to your hungry, eat till you're tired. I drew a big t-shirt uh, with a cartoon on it. But we support all launches and landings. We were there for the, uh, the terminal countdown test. We were there for, we were the engineering eyes for the astronaut office at the Cape. So I, I, I think one year we think we launched eight or nine shuttles. I was prime for, I think, three of those. And a prime, I mean, I'm the last person in the vehicle. I'm the last one that pats a guy on the head shakes her hand or, or guy or gal and closes the hatch and then we run away about three and a half miles and then we watch our you know our work fly into space and it was hands oh down God. the most uh, enjoyable uh satisfying uh job i've ever had next to flying in space and i got to see it up close and personal and uh and then i got assigned to a flight so that was in 2000 2000 got assigned to sts 113 and uh, just, you know, absolutely thrilled. I had a great crew. Uh, Jim Weatherby, uh, Paul Lockhart was our pilot. Um, we had a pilot, Gus Loria. Gus is a Marine aviator. All of us were single anchor uh, gold wing aviators uh, on the flight deck. You know, and, and Mike uh, Lopez Alegria, a, a P3 guy like me, test pilot grad, uh, Captain uh, Jim Weatherby, um, a Navy guy. Uh, ended up having, uh, Gus had a, had a medical issue, couldn't fly with us, unfortunately. And so uh, we got an Air Force guy named Paul Lockhart was our pilot. 
Paco, great guy. And there were, there were four of us. There's usually seven people on a mission, but we had to take three people up and leave them and bring three people home. So that was our primary mission. Our secondary was to do, uh, well, to do that right there. Um, I did three spacewalks and helped assemble the, uh, a truss in the outside of the space station. So that's me. Wow. Looking at my it's fascinating. I, did, I, I never realized, and it makes a lot of sense, of course, that the 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 support team is made up also of astronauts the, the, like it, like you said going in there being the one that's the last one uh, shaking their hand patting their head and 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 closing the door uh, at the closing the hatch that's that's really interesting that it's all people who are part of possible future missions you now they they're out of the crew there's a group of people called the closeout crew one of us is an astronaut, the rest of their suit techs that are responsible for the suit, and there's folks that work, actually work on the vehicle. We had called it with a forward and aft shot. You got folks that work the forward part of the shuttle, folks work the aft part of the shuttle, and they become part of this crew. And one guy leads it, um, and the rest of us, we have big numbers on our back, and our job is to go out there and support getting the crew into the vehicle, and then help, helping take them out if necessary uh, for an abort. Um, and um, but you're touching the real thing. I mean, you're, you're no kidding space hardware. And mm. space shuttle on the launch pad is a living, breathing being. I mean, when it's, it's off gassing and, and you know, you see the pipes with all the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and there's ice all over them, and you can scribble your name on them. And <laughs> it's, you're, it's like it's alive. And it's just a fabulous, fabulous experience. I remember also, and this obviously is in Cape Canaveral, but you you also see the T thirty three doing like chase during landings. How, who, what who handles that? The T thirty eight. They always there's somebody going up in T thirty eight or the shuttle training aircraft, the Gulfstream two, and uh, it's made to be able to fly the twenty degree glide slope. The shuttle comes back at a twenty degree glide slope, at about three hundred knots, and about three thousand feet it rounds out to a degree and a half glide slope, and so they'll actually fly the shuttle training aircraft. Uh, prior to launch just to you know ver verify weather and winds and that's usually the chief of the office that's doing that uh, if he's a pilot and then he um, um, you know they're the one they're the go no go for launch criteria really based on what they see and t-38 once again would would fly he would fly chase for a lot of the early missions uh, a lot of other later missions they, they didn't necessarily fly chase uh, with you but um, you know you come back to cape or you coming back to uh, edwards or yeah, you know, one case, White Sands. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just, I think it was, yeah. So. And and do they they fly alongside during the actual landing? Yeah, they did early on. Remember uh, when they were flying to Edwards, you would see T-38s would fly, you know, in chase al alongside of it. You know, pop the speed brakes, drop the gear, mm -hmm. you know, you know, come down, uh, come down like that. And it's you know, very capable. The T-38 is is the Air Force advanced trainer. Now they're going to, I think they're going to a, a new advanced trainer. But the T-38 that NASA has, you know, glass cockpit, FMS, um, yeah, weather radar, it's got uh, different inlets, it's got different tail feathers, it's got a better performance at higher altitudes because uh, mm -hmm. it flies in and out of El Paso routinely uh, in the summer because that's where they train a shuttle training aircraft. And when they flew the shuttle, uh, they would train out of White Sands. And so pilots would fly to White Sands or fly to Edwards, not Edwards, El Paso. Long runway, high, hot. You know, you don't have the takeoff performance, and so they actually did some modifications and, and improved the takeoff performance of T-38. Wow, wow. Um, hey, I want to—I don't want to lose uh, being able to go through some of these pictures because the pictures that you sent are amazing, and they are not necessarily in particular order. So I'll warn people in advance we'll be jumping back and forward in time here, I'm sure. But uh, take me through some of these because they are—they're fascinating. That guy's name is Rick Welty. Rick Welty was the um, he, he led the closeout crew, the guy with the number one on his back. And you see those green straps. Uh, he worked for the United Space Alliance. Those green straps are there so you can grab them and drag them out in the event he gets incapacitated. Because if you leak hydrazine, if you leak some propellants on the uh, vehicle, uh, you know, it's, it's deadly. And people pass out. These boxes you see on the right side of the picture are um, gas um, or oxygen packs that we would wear in the event there was a, a leak and we had to help rescue the crew or ourselves, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting ready on my suit. Uh, I get ready to climb into the vehicle. That little gold uh, thing right there, it's a little diving board, we call it. Uh, you crawl in on your hands and knees because the vehicle, you can imagine the vehicle sitting this way. So you mm -hmm. crawl in on your hands and knees, and then you lay down on your back on your suit. So Rick is, was a great guy. I worked with him on numerous 
uh, numerous launches. Uh, you get to really, really like the folks that you're doing. And the little plaque you see at the bottom of the diving board is our, our crew plaque. And um, I think I have that here somewhere. <laughs> <Right now. laughs> that's amazing. That's the hatch. That's the hatch. The spatial. It's called the white room. And it's on the orbiter access arm that actually moves over to the shuttle and then, then gets retracted. We close all this down prior to launch and all this stuff comes with us. We close it all down and, and sanitize it so stuff doesn't pop out, you know, and, and hit the vehicle on launch because it's, you know, pretty dramatic, obviously. But that's right. a white room. Yay, P3 Orion. Uh, <laughs> this is, we should have put this in the beginning. This is your, your Orion days. Yeah, that's me. That's that's a skinny me right there, a younger skinny me. Um, it was a fabulous airplane, Lockheed Electra. Um, this is uh, Buzz Aldrin at a uh, the sky. Um, there's a uh, skywalk down in the um, uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, one of the tribes down there built this beautiful walk out over uh, you know 3,000 foot drop to the canyon, and and Buzz Aldrin was invited out. I got a chance to to meet Buzz a few times and and work with him. This was a first walk, so he got to be out there, and uh, that was fun for me. There is, there must be an, an amazing, you know, uh, I say a, a brotherhood, but of course it's, it's brotherhood, sisterhood, like a fraternity essentially of of all people that have have made it into space. Well, you know, one of the things is, you know, as a kid, I watched these guys. These guys were my heroes, and uh, I found myself in Oklahoma once. You know, General Tom Stafford uh, flew in Gemini twice, then flew Apollo ten. And then flew Apollo Soyuz, and he's a, he's a native of Oklahoma, of Weatherford, Oklahoma. And I've got to know the general quite well. And he's he's blessed me with the opportunity to attend a lot of his events. And I get to go out with all the Apollo guys. And and usually I'm the only shuttle person there sometimes. It's 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 weird. And I go in one day and there's this, all these chairs lined up, and here's uh, a lot of flight directors, Glenn Lunny, and who just recently passed away, unfortunately. And the the heroes of Apollo and a couple extra chairs. And I'm standing back watching all these guys going, you know, and they said, well, John, you go, go sit down. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Those <laughs> are the Apollo guys, you know? They, that's, you know, you go, no, you, that's your, you're part of that group now. You need to go take a seat and answer questions. Wow. And, and I, and it's, it's neat. I took, uh, uh, General Stafford was in Washington, D.C. last year when we premiered the movie Into America's Wild and a good friend of mine from Oklahoma, Bill Moore, as a historian, a videographer, um, wrote a book called Oklahomans in Space. Put me on the cover. Yay. Thanks, Bill. Oh, my God. Well, I gotta, I'm going to write that one down. Oklahomans in Space. Yeah. And uh, it, Bill's a great historian. And he calls me and says, hey, John, the general's in town in D.C. Can you come see the movie? I went, duh. Yeah. So General Stafford comes to the Smithsonian Air and Space. He's looking at the lunar module. He's telling me all about it. He's the Apollo capsules and just rattling off. Brilliant, man. And he sits next to me in the movie, and the guy that made the movie, Greg McGillivray and his his team, um, actually filmed General Stafford when he flew on Apollo Soyuz in the movie To Fly, the very first IMAX movie that the Smithsonian's ever shown, and it's been showing continuously since 1976. Michael Collins was the one that uh, that hired McGillivray Freeman Films to make this movie, and General Stafford's now sitting in front of the guy that made the movie, take watching him fly on on a Saturn uh, 1B, Apollo Soyuz. And uh, that was just, he got a standing ovation, you know, introduced the general. And then in the middle of the movie, there's this one segment where this you know, one lady named Miranda is on top of the spire in Moab rock climbing. And she's standing there going like this, you know, and this, this drone's flying around her. And it's just stunning photography. General goes, wow. <laughs> That was pretty neat. Guy's been how many miles close to the moon and, and a movie um, made him go, wow. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so amazing. Here's uh, another one, the, the, the classic shot, probably. Mm -hmm. I gave that to a young man one day, and I signed my name to it. And he goes, that's not you. This guy's really young. <laughs> that's exactly what you said, giving the picture back. <laughs> yeah, giving the picture back. But on the neat thing on the visor, if you could ever, if you want to, some people pull this up on the internet. Look at the visor. There's a real bright white light there that lights up this image. And next to it's a really tall figure. That woman, it was a professional woman's basketball player. And she's also the suit engineer. She was responsible for that suit that I'm wearing. And so really? she was taking the picture. And uh, I apologize, I forgot her name. But uh, yeah, neat people you work with at NASA. They have a variety of backgrounds. But she's, she's in that picture. 
It must be amazing with people with so much passion and, and one common goal uh, to, to be as part of that team. You know, it's not about a, it's not about making a profit. It's about making a difference. It's about doing something for, you know, you think about the, the good of humanity and look at what Apollo did, what Mercury, Gemini, Apollo did for, for the next generations, you know, mm. fundamentally changed life on earth. We went to the moon, but we didn't stay, but we've fundamentally changed life on earth based on the technology and the efforts that went into it have made, have made our life incredibly, um, more more productive i think in a lot of ways yeah well i mean there's so much in our daily lives that 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 really i think the the nasa nasa's work and and the apollo missions and everything else doesn't get enough credit for that's true i think you know so here's here's one i'm in that fireball right there um <laughs> uh, this is my uh this is my first wife debbie and um uh, my daughter um jessica's my, uh, debbie's got an arm around my daughter jessica and my Youngest daughter Amanda is right there. This is on the launch control center. Um, the families, immediate families, go on top of the launch control center at launch. From T minus nine minutes to launch, that's where they are. So they're away from the public uh, to avoid what happened with uh, Krista McAuliffe and the family from uh, the Challenger days. The family's cordoned off. It's a very emotional place. A lot of us as astronaut, uh, as family escorts, stand back and watch families, watch their family fly in space. And it can be very, very emotional. I told my daughter, I said, Jessica, <clears throat> I don't want you looking through the lens of a camera, taking a picture of me. I want you to watch, I want you to watch the vehicle. Somebody will take a picture of you, right? Well, here's a picture of Jessica taking a picture of me flying this thing. And I give her a hard time. She goes, no, dad, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't looking through that, but but bless, no, I love no, my I didn't family. do that. And uh, it was fun. Yeah. Um, that is uh, in the uh, original, the suit room, we get suited up the same place the Apollo folks and Gemini or in the Apollo program, probably part of the Gemini program. Uh, these these Barco loungers right there, those recliners uh, have a lot of history behind them. And so we get suited up in there to check the pressure of our suit. That chair um, was being accessed by the Kennedy Space Center and a friend of mine who runs a crew quarters down there, uh, Lauren Lundy, she called me and she got these chairs. And I said, I said, can I have mine? <laughs> so. That chair is now in Tom Stafford's museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma, at the Stafford Museum on I-40. Oh my God! And and did you get yours? That's it. That's the chair right there. Oh, that's that the one. Oh my God, that's awesome. So MS2. That's the MS2 chair. That's where the mission specialist two would sit uh, in suit up. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. Tell tell me about the difference between the orange suits and the white suits. Okay, this is a launch and entry suit. Actually, LES was the original one. Uh, they're orange because if you have to drop down in the water somewhere, people can see you. You mm. know. So you're in the North Atlantic, you know, God forbid that it would have happened, but that's why it's put, it's a, it's a full pressure suit. Um, and the only time it pressurizes, if there's a leak in the cabin uh, to keep you uh, alive, uh, you know, somewhere in, there's a cabin, uh, a, a pressure leak, it will inflate and it'll, it'll keep you alive. It's got uh, oxygen hookups down here by my knee. It's got a pressure relief valve there on my right side, that uh, little silver thing. And so that's what we wear uh, on launch and entry. Uh, it's advanced crew escape system, ACES suit is what, what this one is. Uh, after the Challenger, they were looking at ways to protect the crew because for Challenger and early on, you know, we wore full pressure suits, but they went now to a pressure helmet and an oxygen helmet. But after Challenger, they looked for a way to to rescue the crew. If something happened, the crew could get out. So they, they built a big bar that would telescope out that main hatch and you'd clip your harness into it and you'd slide out the hatch so you wouldn't hit the wing on your way out the door and you deploy your parachute and then uh, you were in an LPU uh, life preserver unit and then a raft and the whole nine yards and you would have to float until somebody found you. That's that, wow. that's, that's for launch and entry. The white one, the one you saw in the other suit was specifically for doing spacewalks. That's our, our extra vehicular mobility unit. That's what you wear, uh, you know, that guy right there. Um, it's about a 300 pound suit on the earth weighs nothing in space, but it still has mass. You still have to move it around. Um, it's got uh, primary oxygen, secondary oxygen. It's got a nitrogen canisters that go on another pack that you can actually fly yourself around if um, you come untethered from the space station. Uh, it's a, a, a rescue aid called, a, nah, we love acronyms, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, uh, a safer unit. And you can deploy a controller and actually fly yourself back, uh, back to the space station. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know about that. That's fan. That's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, you do it in a virtual uh, reality lab, um, and uh, 
and you put these VR goggles on, you got the gloves on, you can actually you see your hands in this in the computer simulation, and they take you to the end of the space station at night and they kick you off. And they kick you off tumbling in three axes. And your job is to wait about 30 seconds and then deploy this little controller and then turn it on. And it has ring laser gyros in it and it measures your rates of rotation and it fires the jets automatically to stop your rates. And your job is to now uh, X, Y, Z and pitch roll yaw and fly yourself back to where the space station is. First, you got to find it and then you got to fly yourself back. Uh, you don't have a lot of gas and a lot of battery power. So um, don't let go. If you let go, make sure you're tethered at least twice. And, uh, and if it's something has, does happen and breaks, then you have the ability to fly home. That'd be a pretty scary, you know, if you had to, if you had to do that, no one's had to do it intentionally, um, you know, as an accident, they've tethered, they've, Mike LA actually did one, uh, practice that in the Pale Bay of the shuttle in space. Wow. I did not know that existed. That's definitely something for everyone to research a little bit and understand a little bit more about. And, and, like you said, as you said, very limited amount of uh, both battery and gas power to get you back. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, there was a um, Italian astronaut was on space station was doing a spacewalk, and all of a sudden he felt water coming across. I don't know if you heard the story. Uh, the Luca, that's Luca Pomerati is a Italian astronaut, ESA, European Space Agency, and he had a water leak actually, and uh, water was starting. Water doesn't, you know, it puddles up on you. It sticks to you. Surface tension. And it'll actually find, and it was finding, and it got into his ears, he couldn't hear, uh, it was getting close to his nose. They aborted the uh, mission, brought him back in, and I think they ended up half a gallon, had about a half a gallon of water or something in his helmet. Oh my and God. Round on a spacewalk. Yeah. Wow. That is, that's crazy. I did not know about that either. Um, here is some, a couple amazing pictures of your launch. It's about 7.2 million pounds of thrust coming out of the solids in the mains. Each main has about 400,000 pounds of thrust at vacuum. Um, it sucks that the hydrogen and oxygen out of that big orange tank uh, pretty readily. I, I forgot how high. There are a bunch of really neat numbers you can talk about. Uh, the solids burn for about two minutes and five seconds. Uh, ammonium perchlorate, uh, it's a solid paste. Um, they fire a charge right down the middle of it uh, at, at T minus zero, and it ignites that and it burns from inside out. If you remember the Challenger, uh, there was two O-rings were compromised because of the cold weather and that, that pressure uh, caused a little arc of flames to come out and burn the tank and that's what, you know, uh, what destroyed the vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty bumpy ride, about two minutes and five seconds and then it gets really smooth after that on the, on the main engines. They say it's an electric train ride. Uh, it takes eight and a half minutes to get to orbit the last minute you weigh three uh, three times your normal body weight. The the computers actually throttle the engines back, so you don't overstress the vehicle. Um, and a, a couple a couple parts of the stages of the launch. That big water tower right there has about 300,000 gallons of water that uh, dumps onto the launch pad about 16 seconds prior to launch, uh, and it's meant to absorb all the acoustic energy that's generated from the engines lighting off, so stuff doesn't bounce around and and bounce back up and and hit the space shuttle. And they say it's like five or six foot thing of water on the uh, on the launch pad once the vehicle's lifting off. Oh pretty my amazing. God, that is pretty amazing. This, this is an amazing shot. Yeah, some great photographers down there. Um, this is a time-lapse shot of the launch. And I, you know, it's great because it, you tell people, you don't go straight up and quit and the engines quit, you come straight back down because gravity has not gone anywhere. It's still doing its thing. So the, the challenge is to get to going to a speed that allows you to stay in orbit as gravity pulls you back to Earth. So you're in this constant free fall in the space shuttle. That's what weightlessness is, is or microgravity, is you're falling back to Earth as Earth falls away from you. And you're doing about 17,500 miles an hour, uh, about five miles every second. Uh, engine quits. You go from three Gs to zero Gs instantaneously. And wow. stuff floats. <laughs> and you float too. That's that's amazing. Now, this obviously is one uh, an amazing shot from being up there. I took that photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that photo. Um, <laughs> Bay, this is the uh, APDS. This is a androgynous peripheral docking system. You can see the little pedal right here in the shadow. That's how you dock to space station. That is a Russian piece of hardware. Um, the Russians uh, have this andro it's an androgynous uh, system. It's not a male-female, it's androgynous. So when the Apollo-Soyuz came together, 
uh, it was androgynous. That's where it originally came from. And, and so we actually used that on the shuttle for docking. And that system is on, was on the docking port, uh, one of the primary mating adapters on the shuttle. That little white dot you see in the upper right corner, that's the moon. <laughs> you're only really? About, you're only about 200 miles closer to it at a certain point in the orbit. So 200, 250 miles. So. Wow, that's fantastic. Here, here's a, a breathtaking one. <laughs> this was taken from the space station of us. Uh, as you arrived, you, you arrive up, here's a space station. You arrive up underneath it. You do a series of burns. You arrive up underneath it, and then you fly up in front of, and then you slow down and dock. So this was taken on what's called the R bar. If you can draw an imaginary line from the space shuttle, space station to the center of the Earth, that is the bar we're on. We're getting ready to come up. North or South Island, New Zealand, uh, they, that strait of water is called Cook Strait. Um, James Cook sailed the HMS Endeavour through that strait back in the 1700s. Our spaceship is named after his sailing ship, the Endeavour. That's why it's spelled O-U-R. I always wondered that. That was going to be something I was going to ask you about. Fascinating. Yeah. That is that 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 explains a lot about that. So interesting photos that 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 photo of the space shuttle was taken at the same time we took a space a shot of the space station, and this photo was taken by Ken Bowersox out the pilot's window on the dock space shuttle of Mike taking a picture of me, which is the picture right behind me. So Mike has got. <laughs> Mike on camera in his hand, taking a picture, taking that picture of me right there when Ken took a picture of him. <laughs> so, so we're taking a picture of this and he's taking a picture. Wow. What an amazing shot to have. You can see how thin the atmosphere is. The black line, we call it the Terminator, um, between day and night. It takes 90 minutes to go around the earth. So for 45 minutes, you're in, in, um, in sunlight. For 45 minutes, you're in darkness. Sun comes up, goes down 16 times a day. Um, you work, you work a regular, you know, um, 16 hour shift, I guess. And then, uh, you have eight hours, eight hours of sleep in your, uh, in your time frame. but uh, great shot. They're beautiful. That's the, that's the truss we installed the P one truss P standing for port. It's the first one on the left side of space station. Fascinating. It's a, it, it, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous picture. And this, this is that other picture the one that's right behind you. Wave, yay. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> This looks like it's uh, from your training days. That was uh, uh, T-38 at, at uh, Austin Bergstrom Airport. It used to be Bergstrom Air Force Base. Uh, my folks lived in uh, outside of Austin, so I sometimes you you got to get. I got 15 hours a month in the T-38. Sometimes I would go places. Sometimes I could do acro, and you just get you know you got to fly fast. You got to be able to fly in an environment when stuff goes bad, and how do you deal with it? So I I had flown over once and had seen my folks and my dad. I think my dad took this photo. Oh, that's awesome. There's another amazing um, picture with Endeavor in the background. Yeah. Mike L.A. was a fabulous photographer. I mean, he he took way better photos of me than I took of him. I, my apologies, <laughs> Mike. But uh, uh, he was inside the truss, this S0 truss. And as I was, I was, you don't spacewalk, you space crawl, but that doesn't sound cool. You know, you just kind of <laughs> And Mike said, hey, wave. And he's inside, upside down. If you look really close in the visor, you can actually see his reflection. Um, taking a photo with a great, really well framed i mean you got the endeavor there you can see the star tracker windows you can see the reaction control jets the commander's windows and uh, me waving that little cable that line is my tether it's um about the diameter of pencil lead it's wound steel on a reel that'll actually reel you back to space station if you let go if you get pushed off it'll actually slowly reel you back in um i got a tool kit uh, hooked me there in a um, in a body restraint tether brt Lots of acronyms. I could, you know, I'm still that's surprised awesome. years later I can remember most of them. Now the star tracker, you said those windows, so that's how it navigates as part yeah. of the uh, part of navigation. Yeah, you got two. You got one at the x axis and one z axis, or the one's going out the y axis, one's going out the the z axis, and um, it's mounted to the uh, IMU um, the frame where the IMUs, the uh, inertial measurement units, are all mounted. And it's got a pattern. And what it'll do is look. I'm trying to remember if that's right. X Y Z. Yeah, X Y Z. Right hand rule. Um, <laughs> and it maps the stars. And it can open up the. You know, you open them up, and it's got a catalog, and it'll look at the star field it sees, and it'll figure out where it's at. And then it takes that orientation, and then it translates that to the IMUs. And you can use it to update the IMU, the state vector, and um, uh, for attitude. It, just neat yeah. stuff. I mean, incredible amount of uh, technology. Yeah. Just. Just. I mean, so, so many amazing, amazing pictures. 
This just, is the just end, of a, end of a 30 minute ride. I, I had to move, I'm holding on to a, I'm in a restraint on the robotic arm, holding on to a thousand pound cart called a CETA cart, a crew equipment translation aid. And I had to move it from one side of space station to the other to get it out of the way for some work we we're gonna do. And so I rode the robotic arm for about 30 minutes, hanging on to a thousand pounds with my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're tethered to it, you know, and I practiced, you know, what would I do if the arm quit, you know, if the arm broke and I'm stuck out in the middle of, you know, how many ever meters from the space station and then figure out how to, how to take that thing, turn it around, lock it in so we didn't lose it and then shimmy myself back down to the, down the robotic arm back to, uh, to station. We practiced a lot of these things. Luckily, that, wow. uh, everything worked great. So, so let me ask you, um, if you were going to, if you had an opportunity to to you know relive one moment from that uh, from that flight or one one you know ten minute experience or something like that what w what would it be? Um, out on the end of the space station in the P one truss, um, Jerry Ross, who had flown seven times on the shuttle, he and Franklin Ching Diaz hold the record for flying the shuttle. Uh, Jerry was my mentor. I worked for him at the Cape when I was a Cape Crusader. He said at some point in your mission, stop and just take a mental picture of what you're looking at. Don't take a photo, you know, look at it and sear it into your mind because that will, that will mean so much more to you than any other picture you'll ever have. So I was on the end of the space station looking out over the limb of the earth out into the vastness universe and the first time in my life thinking, you know, there's nothing between me and whatever else is out there. And it was a really goosebump OG whiz moment for me is that it, you know, I, I felt really insignificant, but the, the vastness of the universe, I mean, it kind of came, it came into being for me is that, you know, um, there has to be something else out there. I mean, we are a small speck in a, in a tiny little galaxy in an immense, you know, in an immense universe. And Hubble has given us an incredible window on a world, on our universe we never had before. You know, gee whiz. And, and it's fundamentally changed that moment, being on the end of the space station. I actually climbed over the side and I was hanging on by a thumb and a forefinger. If you can imagine hanging on to something about that big with my thumb and a forefinger, and that's all. You know, and and I'm 250 miles above the Earth, and it's the that's the uh, the ultimate cliff, essentially. Um, I'll remember that the rest of my life. That's amazing, absolutely amazing. And well, movie, I want to go back down to Earth for uh, a, a minute now, and and talk about where where you are now, and then also about the movie. Sure. Um, this I, I I have to tell you, I am I, I've got such envy. You live at such a gorgeous gorgeous place out in Montana. This is you and your hangar and uh, a few of the, the, the little babies that live in it. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me about where you are now, what you're doing, and then we'll talk about the movie. I live in Marion, Montana. It's about 25 miles to the west of Kalispell on Highway 2. If you go in towards Idaho, you'll pass our, our runway. Uh, 97 Mike Tango is the identifier. Um, this is my hangar. Uh, actually, I have two airplanes in it. I bought a Bonanza this past summer. Um, and from a, uh, a gentleman out in Chicago, uh, absolutely gorgeous VTL, V35B, or V35A, 1969, V35, pristine. I mean, just an absolutely beautiful airplane. Uh, I have my mall right behind it. So I have a mall M4, 220 Charlie with a Franklin in it. Uh, and this is, this is you with the mall and the, and the big tires. And my tie-dye, yeah, me and my tie-dye. I have tie-dye while travel. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, this is in uh, Council Airport in Idaho. I used to live in central Idaho. The back country was my playground. Did a lot of flying in uh, Hell's Canyon. Did a lot of flying back in the Frank Church. Um, and uh, it's just, the mall is a sporty little airplane. Doesn't go very fast, but it sure gets you some places that you've never never thought you could fly. You can kill yourself 100 knots as you can at 17.5, you know, so uh, <laughs> just, you gotta, you know, be cognizant of what you do. And I love, you know, I still fly. That's that's all. and the planes are just just gorgeous. I love some of these pictures. <laughs> that's uh, we have a little tower, a little um, fire tower. Not really a fire tower. It's a nice tower, just across from my hangar. Just looking out my taxiway, the mall. I'm actually the plow driver. I think I told you today I was plowing my runway. I've got and, that. Here you yeah. go. Me and my dog in a uh, retired uh, Montana Department of Transportation snowplow, and I got out the. <laughs> Plow the runway with my dog. She sits there. It's Emmy, and she sits there. It's happy, happy camper in the, in the air, in the uh, vehicle. And then I got it dried up today. Guy came in in a Piper Cub. Uh, I went flying here a couple hours ago, in the local area. And uh, it's it's you know everything. Everybody, 
the story, uh, I think I told you before, was that uh, there was a classmate of mine named Dave Brown. Dave Brown was uh, unfortunately perished on the Columbia. But Dave lived at a private airport just outside of Clear Lake. He had a Piper Cub and a VTEL Bonanza. And I told myself, man, one day I want to I want to live on a runway and I want to have a VTEL and I want to have a tail dragger. And uh, and I do. And so that's here. And uh, yeah. And and I love that you're the airport manager. I mean, uh, of, of of all things, you want to come out and talk. Hey, you know, go over there. You got a complaint or you want some information about how to fly into the airport? Just call the astronaut. Well, I get I get calls like, is "This John," and went, "Yeah, you the airport manager?" And I go, "Yes, I am." You know, I am. <laughs> so you can find me my phone number, my address. You know, it's it's out there on the internet for uh, if you airnav.com and pull up 97MT, you'll see it. That is, that's just, it, does it ever just like casually come up in conversation with people who just don't know for some reason, you know, you're talking about the airport, you're talking about planes and somewhere in there, it's like, well, you know, you know, when I was on the Endeavor space shuttle, like, <laughs> you know, we call it using the A word and you try and avoid using the A word, you know, because you, it, I don't want to sound pompous or anything. So I was fortunate to do something that so very few people have ever done and I'm blessed for the opportunity to do it. Um, and I know there's a there's a thousand other people, no more than that, that could do it. And um, um, I was was a fortunate one that got selected to be able to do it. And so when you talk to people, you talk about what you do. You love to fly. It's all about aviation. It's about you know this love of flight. And my love of flight took me to you know that right there. But if it hadn't been for all the people I met in my life that came along, my dad, my you know my mentors, my Navy captain that convinced me to join the Navy. Uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So um, it, it, it comes up and the people go, no. <laughs> okay, well then, okay, no, I'm not. And, but I am the airport manager. So <laughs> he's disappearing here. Yay, here we go. Get this back That's okay. No, no worries. So um, the other thing, of course, is, uh, and, and we've, we've got connected through my friend Ariel, of course, Ariel Tweedo. And and she's obviously a friend of yours, so, so wonderful, full of life. And, of course, you guys are in this wonderful movie I cannot wait to see. Uh, and the only reason, of course, is it ha the movie theaters have been closed down. So it hasn't come out. But now it is going to be coming out. It premiered but didn't make it to everybody. Tell me about the, how you got involved and what your experience was with Into America's Wild. Um, this about in 2018, uh, I'd say in late April, um, uh, my wife, uh, I was married to a beautiful woman for um, about nine years. Uh, she passed away from cancer back in 2018. About two or three weeks later, I get a call from this group called McGillivray Freeman Films. Uh, Kathy Allman called me and she said, would you be interested in making a movie with this, uh, with a young uh, Alaskan, um, young uh, Inupiaq uh, uh, Inuit girl? And I went, what's your name? And they said, well, Ariel Tweedo. And I went, is that the girl on Flying Wild Alaska? <laughs> I said, yeah. And so uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to. So for about two years, Ariel and I had the opportunity to fly uh, all across the country, whenever we're from, she's in Brookings, Oregon, Crater Lake. She was at Hood River, learned how to, well, learned how to kind of kite surf. And, uh, and then. Uh, yeah, I heard went, she drank a lot of water. Drank a lot of water. <laughs> uh, but we were, uh, I, Route 66 and down in Shiprock and Gallup, New Mexico, I had to drive a, a white Corvette convertible. My wife actually uh, had a white Corvette convertible, so that was pretty cool to get that little neat little thing showed up in our uh, in the movie. We went to, went to uh, Fringer Lakes, uh, went to Niagara Falls. We went to places I've never heard of before. A Shishlapa is a, a bunch of hoodoos out in northwestern New Mexico, just a very eerie uh, alien type of landscape that's on the earth. Absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, you know, What's Sandstone, a hoodoo? It's a sandstone spire that's got used a big rock on it. And so it's all roaded everything away beneath it. But on top is this, you know, larger, uh, larger formation of harder rock. And it was all a seabed at one time, you know, this whole, that part of the continent. And to be able to walk amongst that and to film, we had drones out there filming. Um, they filmed in my house in, in uh, Idaho, which was great. Uh, I said, come up here to Montana, you know, let's, let's film up here. But this, this, uh, we, I moved up here after that movie was finished. But uh, no, it was just great, great fun. I, it, it, the idea is getting kids back out into the wild, getting to experience nature. This idea that you know I'm energized by getting outside and 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 being in nature, be it on a raft or being in the airplane, being on a bicycle. Um, that's where I get my, that's how I, that's my stress relief essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I bought my plane when I retired from the Navy because I knew if I didn't buy a plane, if I didn't fly, I'd go nuts, you know. Mm. Um, and it's that feeling of satisfaction you get up from going out and being in control and flying something and, and not necessarily in bad conditions, but in some kind of, you know, interesting places to land. I've landed some pretty neat little spots and, and your heart's just thumping just as hard as you laying, laying your back on the space shuttle. So uh, I like that. That's a neat Isn't thing. it wonderful? And, and so much of it, uh, opening it up to other people. I mean, you know, we took our trip out to Glacier National Park. You told us about this amazing place that, that uh, we'll be visiting next uh, when we go out there and the same thing when we go for our Yellowstone for the Social Place Next Adventure. I, where you live is absolutely gorgeous. It's it's just gorgeous. We have a bed and breakfast. There's a bed and breakfast right across the runway for me. Cabin Creek Landing. Uh, gentleman's a former airline pilot and uh, has a beautiful place over there. Folks fly in, tie up, and uh, we have gas. Uh, we have our own gas service here. A little more expensive than most. We bought it last year when things were really expensive. Uh, but it's convenient to be able to, you know, fill up and then taxi across the runway. Um, mm. This is a beautiful place to fly. You know, Idaho has an incredible amount of backcountry strips that are just, just beautiful. You know, and in the summers it can get kind of hairy. You know, flying in the backcountry. A lot of people come out there that have a, have the experience of flying in mountains, and that that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, but uh, you know, when you get you get good instruction, you fly with people that are familiar. Uh, flying in the backcountry is just a, it opens up a whole new world. We have one called Schaefer Meadows up here uh, in the uh, Great Bear Wilderness, um, uh, just outside of, uh, just north of the Bob, Mar uh, Bob Marshall, the Bob, they call it. Uh, we have a lot of strips that are um, that are in the wilderness, but they're not grandfathered in like they were in um, in Idaho. But uh, there's still some beautiful places to fly right on the edge of, of uh, these uh, really remarkable wildernesses up here. That's, that's wonderful. Do you have any plans to uh, attend their venture, do any presentations? My brother's been trying to get me out there. My brother has a 182. You know, we we're flying family. And uh, my brother's been out there and landed on the red dot or yellow dot or whatever. He's got to come. And uh, I'd like to go. Well, the guy that gave me my tail dragger training, um, uh, he goes to goes to Oshkosh every year and, you know, when, when we can. And uh, uh, Raylan Rogers, Raylan lives on uh, Sky Patch in Wellston, Oklahoma. And he gave me 25 hours of duel in the mall. So my insurance would be happy with me, even though I was a test pilot. And, astronaut I said, it really uh, that's what they needed after everything else on your resume <laughs> yeah they go well how much tail dragger time do you have oh five hours not enough <laughs> well you know i was did the space shuttle t-38s everything else they're like yeah but was it a tail dragger uh, that doesn't matter to the to the underwriters no they don't they don't care about that they care about you know have you been in the mall have you ground looped it you know no i haven't i'm not going to so well, come to Air Venture. This is going to be the, I am convinced this is going to be the, the biggest ever, biggest reunion. Hopefully we'll be coming out of everything, uh, uh, out of the dark and into the light to Air Venture. Love to have you. And uh, we can certainly hook you up with a place to stay. <laughs> I have a tent under my, you know, I got a hammock and I hang it and sleep under my wing, you know. Either bring them yeah, all. Why not? Right. I mean, you never know. That's exactly that. Probably embodies everything there is to Oshkosh and Air Venture uh, each year. Is the fact that you can you can go down there, and yes, one of them is going to be an astronaut. Absolutely, no question. <laughs> now I'm looking for. Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able a chance to do that. You know, things open up again. I want to start hitting the road and and make the most of a good cross country plane and make the most of flying in the back country. So, Come absolutely. Back. With us, you know, we got. 97 MT, come up here to Cabin Creek Landing. It's a great place. Oh, oh we'll be doing that. Absolutely, no, no, no question about it. Well, John, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your evening to fill us in on such an amazing adventure that was your life and, and so many, so many fascinating things. I really do appreciate you doing that. That's been my pleasure, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Ariel for connecting us. Yes. So, uh, we can do this, but I appreciate it very much. And have a well, fly safe. You know, Absolutely. And and everything that you do that supports general aviation, I love the transition throughout your life that that actually brings it right back down to the grassroots. That is that is why we do this show. That's why Social Flight exists. Everything is here to support general aviation. And I'd like to thank all of you, of course, for uh, hundreds of you taking time out of your evening to join us here. And again, encourage you as well to uh, support our industry, fly, get some extra training in, buy some stuff for your plane, everything you have to do to support general aviation and keep it strong. You may be saving someone's job, their livelihood, and preserving this wonderful way of life that we all have 
for generations to come and it is really all because of you and so I do appreciate it we have more prizes we have more things coming up send us your stories we have more flying eyes uh, uh, sunglasses to be giving out we've got so many things and again I mentioned a headset that's coming if you get the social flight mobile app and just check in just get out there and fly is all you need to do and again so thank you so so much John for joining us this evening and I wish you all Blue skies. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Fly safe.